Oh my god, it's 12.07, it's Friday, I'm so sorry, I got caught up, it's been crazy today on the work front, really crazy, and <laughs> recruiting to the police, uh, part of the many jewels to the crown. Thank you for joining us at 8 minutes past 12, 14th of January. That means it's one month exactly to the day, just like it was to when Philip from Spain abdicated from the throne 258 years ago. Um, that uh, it's Valentine's Day, a month today. So uh, if you want to get your orders in, uh, so for Factnology mugs with hearts on them, now's the time. I'll make enough uh, to go round, which will be a big fat zero. Talking about big fat zero, I wanted to share with you today. It's because it's today, and I did promise you that it's going to be a tasty day on Factology that we are now rebranding for today only, one day only, as Foodnology. I wanted to share this fabulous article with you, all about 50 tiny skills to improve your cooking today. Now, if you're here with me, in other words, if you're not not here, then you'll be a massive food fan. Uh, listening the other day to um, Daya Rose from uh, Summer Tomato on All The Hacks podcast. Recommend that. Look it up if you can. Full of inspiring information about how to bring healthiness into our lives through what we put in the biggest hole on our faces. Uh, what um, I, I got from that, the, the, the key fact was that um, really there's no such thing as bad food. It's how much of it we put in our bodies. It's a little bit like there's no such thing as poison. It's how much we ingest. It's profound, you know. It would take a very, very, very small dose of Novichok to be palatable. But you get the gist. So uh, today, 50 Tiny Skills to Improve Your Cooking. I wanted to walk us both through this. Uh, I saw this yesterday. I haven't had a chance to properly digest it. Um, I've been reading Reid Hoffman's Masters of Scale, and that's distracted me a little bit. And obviously, there's the whole thing about work and stuff, you know, that kind of gets in the way. But um, what have I been cooking? I, I made a fantastic special fried rice last night. Um, I threw in some miso, threw in some uh, gochujang, which is a Korean red chilli paste that I thoroughly recommend. The miso paste you can buy on Amazon. Buy, you, you, typically, once you open it, you refrigerate. It's good for about a month. Um, it's uh, fermented soybean curd. Tastes delicious. The miso's great because it adds that kind of... Um, What's that thing that they call it? The, the, the meatiness, the umami to a dish. And um, I'm a massive fan of it because it really will uh, turn the dial up a few notches, not to 10. You know, we're, we're not millennials, um, but it really does uh, complement dishes beautifully. And I thoroughly recommend giving that a shot. I mean, there's so many ingredients. One of the things I was going to do this year was actually see how how far we can take our cooking prowess by shopping exclusively at the German supermarkets of Aldi and Lidl. And uh, I spend most of my time there. Um, I admit that. Uh, I, I love to shop in the supermarkets with only a handful of aisles, uh, with most of them taken up with foot warmers or um, uh, circular saws. Um, so let's just go through the list here and just see and, and just make a mental note while we're going through this. Tick the ones off that you already know and then the ones that you don't. Just have a look at americastestkitchen.com. Um, I'll drop this in the notes to go with this article. It'll be the only note, really, because that's all we're talking about today. Um, I don't think I was going to mention anything else, was I, just before we get properly stuck in. Uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about... so. Um, before we get stuck in, I tell you what, what what's what's kind of getting on my or grinding my gears right now. And if you want to be part of a tribe that makes a difference in these two worlds, then give me a shout. Um, one of them was about the World Economic Forum. It's not going to get any more boring than that. Let's call it the WEF because instantly it sounds more appealing, doesn't it? The WEF has come up with the. Uh, top technologies that it believes that we will be using more and more as we approach 2025. And I'm having a good chat today about teachers and teaching and andragogy, which is the art of teaching adults, and pedagogy, which is younger people. And, you know, with the exception of a few, uh, teachers generally 
in how they deliver their knowledge are in the toilet. I, I know, there's probably two or three. I mean, I, I've, so I've worked in education quite a lot. So I know those who are in reception rather than in the bog. They're doing a great job. And reception, I don't mean they're teaching four-year-olds. I mean they're in a more uh, hygienic surroundings because their talents necessitate them being put on a pedestal. But by and large, teachers have so little time to teach because, uh, and I speak back to when I worked at, in Blackpool, um, Departments very rarely had their own admin team to take care of the duties that teachers really shouldn't. So anything that goes on behind the scenes that isn't involved in delivering a better learning experience shouldn't really be in the uh, or the agency of the teacher. It should be by a separate uh, set of professional and support colleagues. That's inarguable to me. If you're hired as a teacher because you are great at inspiring and motivating people to gain the skills and the techniques and the knowledge and the practical application to be better people, then that's your focus. If you're being asked to do stuff that's outside of that arena, then I don't believe that your seat of education is taking its role seriously. Or if it's stretched too far, then it needs to, um, what's that, you know, slim down what it offers so that the teachers can do what they do best. This is not for debate. But I was just thinking about that. So if you are a teacher um, and you feel like you're not delivering your best work, then um, find a different place to do it because people are screaming out for great educators these days. Or find a different subject that you feel more comfortable in. But looking at this WEF report about technologies, and I can share a link to it as well, it's on LinkedIn, I've, I've shared on Twitter, but um, if we can get to a point where um, we find the people who are most likely to motivate people to learn these skills and technologies, then we're probably going to get to 2025 in a better shape. Because right now, I don't think teachers or educators have everything they need to succeed. And therefore, I don't think students, learners, scholars are being given a fair crack of the whip because they're not really getting access to the right educators and the right resources. So uh, the guys behind Masterclass, which is where all the celebrities go to teach that, Martin Scorsese, Gordon Ramsay, Wolfgang Puck, a lot of these people, Jane Goodall, conservation, lots of these, I think uh, Selena's, uh, one of the, Venus Williams, Serena Williams, I think she teaches stuff as well, as well as, there's, there's loads of different subjects. So that's celebrities. I mean, they're not necessarily the best, but they are in the public eye, and therefore uh, we give them that perception of greatness. But the guys behind Masterclass have also produced something called Outlier. Um, uh, I don't know whether that's like a hat tip to Malcolm Gladwell's book or not, but this is what they considered to be the creme de la creme of educators teaching things like calculus. So I think we're getting in the right direction. But I actually believe that the people with the greatest opportunity to teach us these 2025 technologies are actually people who are in the thick of it, who are working in industry right now, and they're learning day to day the changes that are being made. They are seeing the processes in action. They're being efficient. They're operationalizing things that we are maybe only just talking about now. So. I think we need a different route to education. Um, and I know things like guest lectures and associate professors and stuff is a big thing-ish these days, but it needs to be bigger. So that was the first thing. The second thing was, I think we are in urgent need of recalibrating what jobs are at organisations. And uh, while we're now looking at all these different ways to offer flexible, uh, remote working opportunities, I think it's all very well blaming the technology as impeding us, as restraining us from making significant progress. I think also the jobs themselves need to change. And uh, I mentioned this earlier today uh, on LinkedIn, which was things like uh, objectives and key results, the famous OKR, I think will become increasingly more important as managers step up to become leaders and actually remap what their organisation needs to be a 
talking about the WEF, the 2025 organisation. This is going way off kilter from what today's food knowledge is supposed to be. But, you know, the two things that are on my mind. So let's let's get stuck in before uh, we, we, we stray too far off piste. Whisk side to side, that's dead easy, isn't it? So um, I, uh, I make a lot of custard from scratch, corn flour, eggs, the usual stuff. I don't use cream, which will probably be easier, but I just use the milk and stuff. And I think part of the reason why it stays so thin is that I use semi-skim, not whole fat. Uh, or whole milk um, but this idea of and I am just whisking uh, this idea of whisking side to side rather than a figure of eight actually makes a whole lot more sense doesn't it because you do uh, be quicker at it and the quicker you are the more the liquids and the solid matters congeal come together which is great pasta and broth can't recommend this enough and the same with rice especially rice. So my rice now is fruity. Um, I'll throw in some uh, sultanas or some raisins um, and I'll probably throw in some um, chili pepper flakes maybe or um, some um, oh, paprika uh, and of course some, some turmeric, turmeric as well. Uh, just give it some, some colour. But yeah, pasta in broth yeah don't don't just do it in salty water which is great but that's like the intermediate you want to be a rock star so get it in some broth and if you can make your own broth from chicken bones or vegetable scraps you're off to the races stronger taste and garlic great it yes this is easy as well if you've got a micro plane fantastic thoroughly recommend it um, i've got one of those oxo garlic crushes which works just as well as well but yeah the slice in it as well because it doesn't impart too much flavor and if you have people who are a little bit allergic to garlic i mean in the taste sense not as in they're going to swell up like a a big squirrel uh, but yeah slicing it's great so uh but the exterior of the bread i actually use mayo for that one number four um making grilled cheese sandwiches yeah mayo is even better um, butter burns mayo's got a slightly higher um uh smoking uh, temperatures so definitely worth it salt to a dish uh, add an acid such as vinegar yeah um salt acid uh nosrat is her name isn't it um salt something acid heat is a book that you should read talks a lot about this about how um all these different flavors intersect all the do you know you need you, you need a fat you need a, a sweet sour <clears throat> um acidic and fat to come together um, to really make the dish sink. And obviously texture is massive as well. If you can add nuts to the equation or breadcrumbs and bake the breadcrumbs on top, or a tip that I typically use is uh, tortilla, those little nachos, sprinkle them over the top. Um, I've got a great recipe for oven fried chicken. Uh, which actually uses ground up corn flakes instead of panko breadcrumbs, which is what a lot of people use. Uh, little lumpy, yeah, don't over whisk. Now you know the whisk, the side to side motion, don't use it overzealously uh, when you're making batter for pancakes. Uh, loads of stuff here. Uh, add water when you're um, looking for crispy bacon in the frying pan. That's a massive one, isn't it? Counterintuitive as well. I like that. Um, leapfrog method. Recommend you look at that. It's great. It's when you um, slice down, then across, and then sideways, and it produces a fine uh, onion chop. Strongly recommend that. Um, yeah. Love uh, point 11. Uh, capers or olives. Uh, love capers. Capers are really used. Capers you can buy, for goodness sake, in Aldi. So get some. Keep things clean. Yeah, love that. Don't cook with avocados because I'm not a millennial. Um, this this whole idea of um, roasted chicken skin. You, so it's difficult because I brine everything. I discovered the art of brine. I don't sourdough, but I do brine. I um, I brine chicken 24 hours before um, because it does make it a lot more moist. Obviously, you can't do that and have... Um, uh, crispy skin if you're you know if you're brining a whole chicken um, difficult combination there uh, you can have a bit like love and marriage you can't have one without the other um, uh, scallops can eat um, uh, allergic uh, what else we got here cookie butter so I'm not so I've got a fabulous recipe for um, easy naan breads I can share with you just ask me um, 
and I throw in cheese, I kind of make a money bag, I roll it out a little bit so it's a, a disc, then I throw some cheese inside, cheddar's fine, um, seal it up like a money bag, and then roll that out again, throw that on a dry pan, um, because it'll have a little bit of oil on it. When you roll something out with a rolling pin, typically I put a little bit of oil on the rolling pin, that oil then passes to the food. Food goes in the uh, smoking hot pan um, and cooks within two or three minutes, both sides, one minute, one and a half each side. Beautiful. Cheese naan bread. Wow. And you can throw some stuff like coconut if you like. Uh, you can go down the um, Kimanan route with some uh, lamb mince as well if you want to go down that, if you want to be that sophisticated. Um, but, oh, naan bread, honestly, go with everything. Herbs in ice cube trays, yeah. So I hate wasting money here. We're on number 34. I hate wasting money. So when you buy herbs from the supermarket, because let's face it, who's got time to grow them? and you don't want to waste them, chop them up, throw them in an ice cube tray, freeze them, and then, wow, take them out, and they're ready to rock. Fabulous. Don't do 38. Don't be a pussy. Get a pan, boiling water, bit of lemon juice, bit of acid. Use your whisk, but don't do it side to side. Do it figure of eight, or just do it round the pan, for God's sake. Get it spinning. Plop, using a ramekin if you've got one, or, or if not, some sort of a measuring spoon. Throw the egg in the swirling water. Two minutes at most, beautifully poached egg. And if you want to get rid of all those sort of spider trails off the poached egg as well, if you throw the egg itself into a sieve before you throw it into the swirling water, that will then let all of the extra bits of albumen, the clear stuff that surrounds the yolk, that'll drain away and you'll get the perfect poached egg. Right, I'm done. That's good. Thanks for that. I hope you enjoyed today. I certainly did. Thanks for joining me. We are back next week for much more of Thacknology. So I hope you have a great day and I will see you.